Christine Pozelski, and thank you for joining us today. With me today is our guest, Father Peter Clark, who is the director of the Institute of Clinical Bioethics and professor of medical ethics at St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. As an internationally known scholar and clinical bioethicist, he's authored over 150 journal articles and several books in the field of medical bioethics and played an influential role in developing and updating our healthcare policies. Father Clark is a Jesuit priest and has a PhD from Loyola University of Chicago. Welcome Father Clark and thank, thank you, you for much. joining us thank today. You. My first question is could you explain to our audience the role of a bioethicist in our current healthcare delivery system? I think the role of a bioethicist is, is multidisciplinary. So I think first we serve as an ombudsman for families and patients just to make sure there's clear and effective communication going on between the physicians and the patients. So we serve as almost an intermediary when there are conflicts resolved. Uh, we're a teacher, we teach medical residents and interns, we teach undergraduates, we teach graduate students, and we also are involved in clinical research. So we're doing research uh, both clinically and theoretically in areas that we feel would be helpful for the clinicians and also for, for the general public to understand what's going on in the field of bioethics today. And could you explain the process that follows suit when you're contacted? Sure. Are you contacted either by a hospital administrator, the physician, or sometimes are you contacted by patients or their families? Okay. An ethics con that's referred to as an ethics consult. An ethics consult can be called by anyone. So it could be a physician, it could be a nurse, it could be a social worker, it could be a patient or their family. You know, anyone can call an ethics consult. The consult, how we've set it up, and we, we consulted 17 hospitals uh, in three states. How we set it up is we have a, a kind of a gatekeeper. The gatekeeper is usually the director uh, or the chairperson of the ethics committee. Uh, what the gatekeeper, so all ethics consults would come to that individual. That individual then each month we have a team of three uh, ethics committee members who serve on the consult team. So it's usually a clinician, it can be you know a social worker, it could be a nurse, it could be anyone, but there are three member teams. But in reality there are five because legal counsel and myself are on call 24-7. So if they get into a situation you know where they need some legal advice or ethical advice, we can be called. So the, the gatekeeper would give the three-person team um, the consult. So they would go up, they would read the chart on the patient, they would speak to the appropriate people, the patient, the patient's family, the physician, uh, the nurses, whoever was involved in the consult itself. Nine times out of ten they can resolve the conflict and they what, what they'll do is render recommendations that they'll place on the chart. So there's a specific question that must be asked. So what is the ethical issue of this case? So let's say it's a an issue about competency. They would then recommend what we should do in that situation, document it in the chart, and then each month the ethics committee meets and we review all the consults for that month just to give the full ethics committee um, you know, uh, educational training on how to handle some of these cases. So is the team set up new, something that's newly implemented? No, we, you... we've been doing this for about five years. I mean, every hospital has different ways they uh, coordinate a consult. This is the way we found to be most effective uh, in that you can't have, you know, it's just kind of trying to find people on a hit or miss aspect is not helpful. Having three people who are designated per month seems to be much more beneficial. And they work very closely as a team that way. Um, so you kind of touched on this, the involvement that they go into with like reviewing mm -hmm. charts and um, so we'll press upon something else. Um, so I know that there are different levels of issues in the biomedical mm -hmm. field of all complexities. Is there something that you find to be most commonly brought to your attention to be consulted on? I would say lately the biggest issues are always competency. Is the patient competent and if not, who then makes medical decisions for them? So in the state of Pennsylvania, there are three ways somebody would make a medical decision. You, the patient can appoint somebody to be their durable power of attorney for health care. Mm -hmm. Now the interesting part of that is we have many family members that will come in and say, I'm my mom's POA, power of attorney. Nine times out of ten, that's a legal document that deals only with finances. It does not give that individual the right to make medical decisions. So therefore, it has to be something that in the state we refer to as a durable power of attorney. It's a very easy document. I assign you to be my durable power. I sign and date it, and two witnesses sign and date it, and that's all you need. And that person at that point would make decisions. If you don't have a durable power, it then goes to next of kin. And every state has a different hierarchy on that. So it's spouse for spouse. 
which is fine, but in the state of Pennsylvania, you could be separated from your spouse for 25 years and you're still the next of kin. You may not even have seen him in 25 years. As long as there are no divorce proceedings pending, you're the next of kin. Now that can become very, you know, sticky at times. I can imagine. Um, and then it goes children. But the interesting thing in Pennsylvania, it's the, it's the, the children are all equal. So if you have five children, all five are equal. You know, we have some residents will say, oh, it's the oldest daughter, or it's the oldest, no, it has nothing to do with that. It's the, the five are equal, and it's majority rules. So if I need consent, I need three out of the five to give consent. The interesting comes when you have four kids, and like say two say intubate, two say expate, what do you do? But the law again intervenes on that, and it says you give them a reasonable amount of time to make a decision. My residence, Joe Clark's law is two hours. You can't come to a decision in two hours. We tell them we're gonna remove all of them, and we're going to go and obtain guardianship from the state. That usually straightens them up pretty quickly when they come to a decision. And then it goes down the pecking order. Siblings, uh, nieces, nephews, cousin. But the last one that the state legislature put in, which I think has been very effective, is friend. Now, a friend is good. So Mrs. Murphy lived next door to Mrs. Lieberwitz for 25 years. Yeah, she's going to be willing probably to give consent for a blood transfusion. But would she be willing to remove somebody from a ventilator? So that's the real issue we need to ascertain prior to allowing them to make the decision. Is this patient willing to make all medical decisions even end of life? And then finally, if you have no one, we can rely on the court and you go to the court and petition for what we refer to as a guardian ad litem, a friend of the court. And the court will appoint someone to make decisions for you. So I mean, I think those issues are important. Um, how to activate a living will. I think many many physicians are not even aware of what activates a living will. So you could have a living will, but the docs can't look at it really until it's activated. The only one who can activate that is the attending of record. And to activate it, you need two criteria, incompetent and a documented end stage condition, or incompetent and permanently unconscious. Once you meet the two criteria, the living will must be implemented or activated. Once it's activated, even if you have a spouse and the spouse says, intubate my husband, I must listen to the living will because it's a living will, it's the person speaking. So that sometimes can be confusing. I think in this day and age, one of the biggest problems we're dealing with is medical futility. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, you know, we had this whole concept of paternalism. Doctor went to medical school, doctor knows best, doctor tells you what to do. You know, in the 70s and 80s, all of a sudden people become much more educated about the medical issues, so it's really autonomy took on a new, uh, almost emphasis, to the point where in some ways I think it's swung to the opposite end of the spectrum, that patients are now dictating treatments. So the physician will say, you know, uh, the, uh, the oncologist will say the chemotherapy isn't effective. And the patient will say, I want the chemotherapy anyway. Nine times out of ten, I think physicians will capitulate and give it to them because it's just easier. The problem is it's a waste of resources and it's not good medicine. So physicians for many times have had this issue where, you know, if, if it's medically futile, I'm not going to give the treatment. But then they were left kind of out on a limb by themselves. So what one of our systems, the Mercy Health System, we created a medical futility policy, which is called Guidelines for Resolving Disputes. And it's a policy you go through various steps. It would take four to five days. So it's, it's very time, uh, there are time constraints on it. So the physician informs you that the medical treatment is ineffective. At that point, the patient says, I still want everything done. We offer them a right of a transfer, transfer to another physician or transfer to another institution. We give them about 48 hours to seek such a transfer. If they can't, they still want everything done, we inform the chief medical officer we need a second opinion. So the chief medical officer appoints a second independent opinion. If the second opinion within 24 hours says it's medically futile, we inform the patient or the family that we have two opinions now that are medically futile. They still want everything done. Within 24 hours, it must go to the ethics committee. The ethics committee hears the case. We bring the family member in or the patient. They give their position. The physician comes in and presents their position. And then the ethics commission, the committee renders a recommendation. If the recommendation is it's medically futile, we will stop all treatment immediately because it's effective for the patient, it's good medicine for the patient, it's good for the physicians, and now physicians feel like they're backed up. And it's also good legally, because the legal system was saying to us, these cases are coming to us, but we as lawyers or we as judges don't really have a criteria for determining medical futility. That's why we put this implementation into effect. So that's been a big issue. Um, there's always issues, do I have to put a feeding tube in my mother? She's 92, she has advanced dementia. Uh, there are issues such as, can I turn off a pace, can I deactivate a pacemaker? 
you know, the cardiologists are very uh, hesitant to activate pace pacemakers, but a pacemaker is equivalent to a ventilator, it's equivalent to dialysis, it's equivalent to a feeding tube, and we allow for the removal or non-initiation of those, pacemaker fits into the same category. So I mean, they're really the issues that we're finding that are problematic in many ways. But I mean, it can be anything. I mean, I yeah, I think some of the new issues that are coming down the road are genetics. I mean, I think that's going to be a major issue, especially in beginning of life issues. Um, so I really think the two main areas that we spend most of our time on would be beginning of life issues and end of life issues. Um. Does every hospital require a um, ethical policy, and if so, how is that process created? Okay. Creating the policy. It every JACO, which is a Joint Commission for Accreditation, uh, stipulates every hospital has to have an ethics committee. So, what is an ethics committee? An ethics committee is a multidisciplinary group. So, we have physicians, nurses, PT, OT. Uh, we have a, always a community member from outside. Uh, there's a legal counsel, bioethics pastoral care. Uh, it's really very interdisciplinary, so you look at all aspects that could come to that committee. Usually about 20 members. They meet uh, usually once a month, and the committee is, is given three kind of uh, uh, marching orders. The first is they do ethics consults, and they're available 24-7. Second, they review policies and write policies for the hospital in regards to ethics. And third, they do educational aspects. So they'll they give educational aspects to the nursing staff, to the, to the physicians, to the residents, whatever it might be. So they're really the three mandates that an ethics committee does. It depends. Every hospital is different. Some hospitals, they meet quarterly. You know, most of the hospitals we work at, they meet monthly. And usually how we operate is we have about a 30-minute, uh, for an hour meeting, a 30-minute educational aspect. So we may have a physician come in and talk about brain death. We may have um, uh, somebody from nutrition come in and talk about the various types of feeding tubes. And then usually we have a resident present a case. And the idea being because we have so few cases coming anymore to the full ethics committee, this really gives the ethics committee a chance. How would we have handled this case should it have come to us in a full-scale ethics council? Interesting. Um, so how do older physicians stay updated on current issues as we see a change in science and trends and what people's wishes are? In many ways, the older physicians are still in the mentality that, of paternalism. You know, they went to school, they're very well educated, they know what's good for their patient. Um, in many ways, I think they have seen ethics, and in particular bioethicists, as almost adversarial. You know, you're questioning my position on something. Until they get into a situation where it's detrimental to them and we help them out, I mean, then all of a sudden it, it kind of turns the table on it. I think the new residents are much more educated, so I think uh, not enough. I think the medical schools aren't doing enough in medical ethics. Very few medical schools even offer a course in medical ethics, which is problematic. But I think in any of our institutions, we do a core curriculum, ethics core curriculum. So our residents have one formal ethics lecture per month. And then what we instituted five years ago is we instituted something called ethics teaching rounds. So ethics teaching rounds are multidisciplinary. So it's the ethicist, it's somebody from um, mission, it's somebody from usually social services, social work. There's usually nursing represented, a physician represented, and maybe pastoral care. The residents from the ICU will come in and present each case in the ICU. So patient one, bed two, bed three, whatever it might be, briefly medically, and then we ask questions ethically. Who's the next of kin? Is there a living will? Um, does the next of kin know, their, know the full status of their medical situation? Those type of questions. In five years, we found that we've cut ethics consults by 50%, which is good because what we're doing is red flagging these cases that we think down the road could become detrimental or even put the physician in an adversarial position. So what's the process of eliminating that as a consult? Do you talk then with the... No, it, it, it's kind of a pre-consult. So what we do is we kind of say to the resident, you really not, you know, there's no family member here. There's no one here. You need to seek guidance from the courts right now. So it's almost doing something proactive 
for them to do that. And that's been very effective. And the other thing, all their boards, they have ethics questions on their boards. So this is really, we've, we, our residents have scored in a 98th percentile on ethics because we really are giving them a good clinical basis for what they should know about ethics. And the other thing, they, they're not, you know, every medical school has this online legal course and it's a one credit course. But if you're taking a, if you're between anatomy and physiology, that's three credits in med school and you have a one credit yeah. legal course, you're not going to spend a lot of time with a legal course. However, it's the legal course that's probably going to keep them out of trouble. And they don't, I don't think they really understand that. And then what we say to the residents on the first day of residency is that, you know, you're licensed now in the state of Pennsylvania. You need to know the laws because, and ignorance is not a defense in the state of Pennsylvania, so that gets them a little nervous. Yes. But then, so what What these teaching rounds also do is really gives them a good legal background, too. Good. Um, so medical ethics is an area of medicine that's greatly affected by religious observance, mm -hmm. um, and how do you think religious beliefs affect your role as a bioethicist in complying with patients or hospitals? Yeah, this is, we get in, I don't think, the medical schools, again, have done a very good job teaching the medical residents about some of the religious exemptions. So in particular, we have a number of residents who are international, so they really don't understand that we have the First Amendment to the Constitution, which is religious freedom. So we will talk about the four basic religions, and we'll talk about where their exemptions are. So for example, the Jehovah Witnesses. Jehovah Witnesses are exempted from blood transfusions, not blood products. Blood products are a matter of conscience for each one, so albumin and platelets and things like that. Uh, you know, but we, you know, so does a patient have a right, their hemoglobins fall into three, to say I don't want a blood transfusion? Yes. So the reds, well, I can't just sit there and not help this patient. Well, there are viable options. We have HUP, we have uh, Temple, we have Abington, we have St. Christopher's that are bloodless product centers. So we do have something called synthetic blood products where we'll give those physicians temporary privileges in our hospitals to come up and give the synthetic blood products. I don't know, they're very effective many times. Or we transfer the patient down. The bigger question then with them is what about children? So I, we also represent St. Christopher's for children. So we had a recent case, we had a 15 year old who was a Jehovah Witness. She needed a blood transfusion, she did not want it. And her parents, who are her legal guardians, did not want it. Now, 1944, Prince versus Massachusetts, Supreme Court case, parents can make martyrs of themselves, but they can't make martyrs of their children because you don't know at the age of 18 to become a Jehovah Witness. So we have a right at that point to get a court injunction and transfuse against the parents' consent. However, surgeons got very angry at me. I said, we have to offer that young woman one more viable option. And the residents will sit there. I said, this is ethics. This isn't religious. And the option is emancipation. She has the right to seek emancipation from the court. Judge came in, spoke to her for an hour, walked out of the room and said she's an emancipated minor. So therefore she was allowed to bleed out. The second one are the Hasidic Jews. The Orthodox Jews, in particular in New Jersey and New York where there are laws, are exempted from the brain death criteria. So where we will do one apnea test, remove them from the ventilator and see if they're breathing, and then do a confirmatory test. If we, at the end of that second confirmatory test, we pronounce death, you're brain dead, we would turn off the ventilator, and at that point in time, the, the patient is, uh, is dead. However, if they're Hasidic Jew, we will maintain them on the ventilator until their heart stops. So we're, we're because that in the Torah, that's, you know, quite uh, one, of the, one of the regulations there. The third, and this has become, it's more recent, is the, uh, Orthodox Muslims. So they're exempted from something, we have two big drugs that we use for blood thinners, heparin and lovenox. They're pork based. So for interesting, for Jews, they are not allowed to ingest pork, but they can inject. So for the for strict Muslims, no injectable, no ingestible. We must inform them that it's pork based. And then it's up to their imams to make the decision whether they can use it or not. So one, we've had two cases, one imam said yes, one imam said no. It's really up to that religious leader to make that call in that particular case. You know, uh, the last one is the Catholics. I mean, we, you know, we, have, we won't do direct abortions, we won't do direct sterilizations, we will not give out artificial contraception unless it's needed for some type of medical reasons. Uh, the interesting new case is there's a new drug out for shingles, shingle X. Uh, there were two drugs, the older drug was created from uh, fetal, aborted fetal tissue. But the church allowed for it because there was no viable option. We have a new drug now that is not created from aborted fetal tissue. So now we're demanding we could only give the shingle X, which is the new drug. 
and then we we also go over with our residents there are, you know we need to be sensitive to religious concerns so for example we have a very big Hmong community from Cambodia that are Buddhist in uh, Lansdowne in fact they have a temple there um, we now and we've learned sometimes the hard way that when a Buddhist dies we cannot touch the body particularly the head for two hours because it's the head where they believe the soul exits the body and that's a very sacred aspect to them so for two hours we leave the body alone and then the family comes in and dresses the body so I mean I, I think we you know it, we're a multi-religious multicultural city and I think we need to be very sensitive to those needs and so we're training the residents on that and the idea is the domino effect we train the residents hopefully they'll train the attendings you know to be quite um, you know knowledgeable about these religious beliefs and also their constitutional concerns I mean these these are federal laws I mean they have the right under the United States Constitution to seek religious freedom and and let me tell you most of these individuals know their rights and I think we have every we have every responsibility and I think that's our job as bioethicists really to make sure that we're sensitive to the needs of, of our patients. Okay. Um, okay, so as our uh, medicine and healthcare system continues to change, how do you see the role of bioethicists affecting the practice of medicine within the next five years? Less maybe, you were saying you've already cut down on the number of mm -hmm. consulting jobs. I think part of our job too as bioethicists is to be um, to send up the red flags when we see an issue that's problematic. So for example, here in Philadelphia, we know we have 50,000 undocumented Africans in West Philly. We have 40,000 undocumented Hispanics. Obamacare doesn't cover them. So if an undocumented comes into, let's say, Mercy Hospital of Philadelphia, into the ER, there's a law called EMTALA which is the Emergency Medical Training Act. So we have to stabilize you, but we don't have to treat you. But if you come in and stage renal disease, to stabilize you, I have to dialyze you. Once I dialyze you, I can't stop. So who's paying for the dialysis? They can't get, they have no insurance. They can't seek insurance. They can't even get any type of Medicare or Medicaid because they're undocumented and they're legal. The Sisters of Mercy, because of the ethical and religious directives that the Catholic Church is under, deal under the idea of common good. All people are equal. I don't care if you're black, white, rich, poor, uh, foreign, domestic, gay or straight. Everyone gets the standard of care. Right now we're paying for 10 men full price for dialysis. But the point the bioethics that we brought up to them are, if you get 15 more of these, do you put the hospital in financial jeopardy? And then who do we have? So what we did was we created something proactively. We went into the African community. Now they're very, the, the undocumented are very skittish because of ice and everything like that. So we went to a, a church that they worship and we educated 10 health promoters in that church. And then the students from St. Joe's, we have PCOM students and the medical residents from Mercy. Once a month we do a clinic. So we, we, treat, we test for hypertension, obesity, diabetes, cholesterol, um, you know, we do height and weight, we do all of that. We now have a dental clinic, we have an eye clinic, and we do prenatal care for women, and we are now giving out something called the baby box. A baby box came out of Finland, and what it did was it decreased the infant mortality rate to 2%. It's a, literally a box and it has a cushion in it and there's $75 worth of bibs and binkies and those type of things. We educate the mothers on the importance because many of the undocumented can't afford a crib mm -hmm. so the children will sleep in the bed with the parents, the parents roll over in the middle of the night and suffocate the child. So this is one way of cutting that down. So we've done that with the African community, we now do it with the Hispanic community and we're running these clinics once a month and what we did was we found donations so any so you go to the clinic you go through and we have residents will check your card with all your criteria if they really believe your diabetes is out of control we refer them to the ambulatory care clinic at mercy hospital of philadelphia we will see everybody for free and what we've done is we've set up an account there that we've gotten donations for that we will provide one free x-ray one blood series of blood screening lab work we'll do tetanus vaccinations and we'll pay for any medication for diabetes or hypertension. So the idea being if we can treat these individuals proactively we're not going to get to the point where they're coming into the ER and stay adrenal. So I mean it's it's that's an issue that's not going away. The immigration issue is not going away. 
I think one of the biggest issues coming down the road that physicians are not well trained in is genetics. Um, as you know, Arcadia is the only university, I think that there are two in Pennsylvania, Arcadia and Pitt, that have uh, uh, genetic counseling. We just don't have enough genetic counselors. Physicians maybe get one genetics course. So we're doing all this genetic screening, but who's able to understand the results? And the, some of the areas that we're raising concerns are, we just had something called the beginning of life issues. So we now can do something called PGD, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So if you and your husband want to have a child, but you know your husband's a carrier of hemophilia, you don't want a child with hemophilia. So what we'll do is we'll remove five eggs from your ovaries in in vitro fertilization and place them into a Petri dish. We fertilize them in the Petri dish with your husband's sperm. So we have five fertilized embryos now. You know from biology, the embryo will start dividing two cell, four cell, eight cell, 16 cell. At the eighth cell, I can take one cell from each of the embryos. It doesn't harm the embryo. I can test for up to 2,000 genetic anomalies, depending upon how much you want to pay. I know that embryos 1, 3, and 5 have the gene for hemophilia. 2 and 4 don't. So we destroy 1, 3, and 5, and I only implant 2 and 4. Now, the Catholic Church has a problem with that because it's direct abortion. But many secular have no problem. In fact, they advocate for that because we can now remove some of these genetic anomalies. So about six months ago, we had an interesting scenario presented to us. We had a genetically deaf couple. They only want a deaf child because they believe a hearing child would be detrimental to the family and detrimental to the hearing community. Yeah. They found out the embryos 1, 3, and 5 were hearing, 2 and 4 were deaf. They only implanted the deaf embryos. So I mean, we're getting to that point now. What, now some people would say, well, they have every right to have a deaf child. Okay, but let's look at this broadly. That child's going to need social services. That child's going to need special education. You are paying for that as part of the community. I mean, where do we draw the line? I think the biggest issues with this genetics will be the whole idea of therapeutics going to enhancement. For example, if we have a child with dwarfism, I can give that child a growth hormone. I can bring that child baby up to 5'7". That's respectable. But now we have parents coming and say, I want my little Johnny to have the growth hormone because if I can get him to seven foot, he has a chance of an NBA scholarship or an NCA scholarship. So where do you draw that line between therapeutic and enhancement? And I think we're going to see more and more of that. And I don't think our physicians are well trained in handling what to do with this. So I think it's our job as bioethicists to really raise the red flag on that. The other area that I think that is crucial right now is the opioid epidemic. And you were asking the difference between the older doctors and the younger doctors. The older doctors are quite set in their ways of giving out opioids. Now we always knew opioids were only used in prior to the 1990s for end of life care. If you were dying, we put you on opioids or for, you know, if you just got had some type of critical surgery. In the 1990s, the pharmaceutical companies like, uh, you know, Purdue Pharma and all that created oxycodone and then told physicians it's not, you know, it's not addictive when they knew it certainly was addictive. So all of a sudden now we have the opioid epidemic, epidemic and now we're, the physicians are cutting back on the opioids. People are then resorting to something, the heroin clinics. What are we doing about this? I mean, everyone's almost throwing their hands up. So we just created a research project on the safe injection sites. So Philadelphia has proposed it, but we've heard nothing about it. So we had four St. Joe students who were researchers, four PCOM students, Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, and four Mercy students, four Mercy residents. We created a paradigm for how Philly should create the safe injection site uh, at Kensington. We've just presented that yesterday to the mayor, the DA, and to the health commissioner, and we just submitted the paper for publication. So, I mean, it's those type of issues that I think bioethics needs to be in the lead on because I don't see anybody else picking up the slack to do that. Correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it's either Vermont or New Hampshire has safe injection sites. None. There are none in the country. So in fact, it, it, there's a hundred worldwide. The two that we looked at were Vancouver and they just started one in Toronto. Of those hundred worldwide, there's never been an opioid death at any of those centers. So, but what we're proposing is our focus should be on, you know, you can't, you know, some people say, why are you wasting money creating these sites? You know, you're giving drug addicts the opportunity to shoot up drugs just get them into rehab. Well, number one, we don't have enough rehabs. Number two, as you know, 
you can't force people into rehab. So I think what we're doing, and I think the Catholic Church is a big advocate of, you know, sanctity of life. We need to keep them alive until they are ready to get into rehab. So that's what our focus is on, keeping them alive until they can get into rehab. So that's why we're proposing this. And it's very controversial. And not, there's not one. Four mayors have proposed it. Philadelphia, de Blasio in New York, Seattle, and San Francisco. They're the only four cities. Not one has instituted it yet. Because here's the problem. If I create a safe injection site in Kensington, there's a federal law called the Crack House Statute. You cannot have a facility where you distribute or allow drugs to be sold or allow drugs to be given that are illegal. So the federal government, even though the city will declare this a public health emergency and overlook it, the state will overlook it, the federal government can still come in and shut us right. down. There's where the problem is. It's this conflict between state law and federal law. So we're not sure what's going to happen. But we've proposed the paradigm because no one had proposed it. So and I, and it was really interesting to see the workings of undergraduates, medical students, and residents, and they worked beautifully together, to the point where they created a poster and were invited to present the poster to the International Opioid Conference at Harvard Medical this past summer. So I, mean, I, I do think we can make a difference. I think it's going to be controversial, but I think it's our role to really, you know, spark or you know create the spark but also follow through can we do something to put this to implement these ideas I think you brought up a lot of great mm -hmm. points and I appreciate your mm -hmm. time sure. thank you for joining us sure. and giving us your feedback thank you very much